device. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation, granting. I'm also very happy to be here and honored to be here. So I look at technology from a much more civil point of view. Uh, we are going to analyze some technologies that are going to reshape our way of defending ourselves and our security in the future. Uh, just to present myself, I work, uh, I'm an IFTF foresight practitioner. This means that I work with an institute called the Institute for the Future. We do research on future trends, models, and ecosystems. Um, we go from research on food, to healthcare, to technology, and to the global ecosystem. I'm also the founder of Qubit, which is a small startup working on virtual reality. The Institute for the Future, just a, a few words, is a 48 years old institution, probably against one of the oldest institutions with foresight. It's actually, uh, apart from Rand, because the founder of the Institute for the Future is a guy that's pretty long time. <clears throat> a little bit of introduction to what I'm going to be talking about today. So, this is our world today. In 10 years, Facebook reached 1 billion users. It took only 5 years for Uber to become, to have more cars in New York than New York yellow taxis. And finally, it took only 24 hours with the Apple Research Kit to gather data, medical data, from people subscribing to the services and it took only 24 hours to collect as much data as 50 research centers in the world would collect in one year. So this is just to let you know how fast we're going into the 21st century. So uh, in, this, in this parabola, we've seen how media has converged into a social networks. We all know about this. We've also seen though, how factories and offices have moved into the internet some of their tasks. We have micro-workers, we have co-working platforms, we have crowdsourcing, and we even uh, put online some of the processes of our production. But we also have our ID online. Our identities are spread out in various social networks. We have a little bit of us on LinkedIn, a little bit of us on Facebook, and so on. So this is getting a little bit confusing. There's a lot of information around, a lot of speed. So if you're getting too confused, you can always hire me and go back to class. <laughs> the reason why we, are, we can be, or some of us are a little bit confused, is because we are literally deconstruction, deconstruction, deconstructing the institutions of our past to rebuild the foundation of our future. In 10 years, we'll likely be 8 billion people. So at the Institute for the Future, we analyze that in this very crowded world, we cannot talk anymore about one single global economy. So we identified and defined seven new, well, five new economies and two old economies. Let's start with the old one. We come from a we know from a world of corporate economy, we know this very well. Corporate economies are the corporations, the large corporations. They are based on legitimacy and scale, their dimensions. Some of them are bigger than some countries. But they're also subject to crisis. We know we have seen many cases of large corporations falling in <coughs> one day. There is a problem because large corporations have less return on investments and on their assets. So they, they constantly need to find new ways to maximize those returns so they have little growth. There's also the problem of less fixed jobs. They need to maintain fixed jobs, but the overall economy is going the other way around. And it's going to be very fragile in the next decade. The consumer economy is the other side of the corporate economy. It's us consumers, us families. It's really built on families' expenses. But families are also changing. Families are not the same as they were 20 years ago. Our fathers saved all their lives to buy a house. We go into debt for leisure, education, and traveling, and to buy new tax. We also invest in new identities. And we live, we developed a hunger for immediate gratification. 
And that's exactly what corporations are doing. They're trying to build for us immediate gratification, make products very easy to reach, make new ideas and new products for you to have immediate gratification. And here we go into the new economies. We've seen the rise of the collaborative economy. Of course, it comes from the collaboration platforms we have online. So it's, it brings up the concept of legitimized corporations versus legitimized individuals. Corporate assets versus impersonal assets. Because through collaborative platforms, we can take our personal assets and make them more valuable. We can take our car and share it and make money on this asset. If we have an extra room in our house, we can rent it out and make money in it. So in this economy, everything that has to do with collaboration and crowd is really the basis of it. We have one very important concept in this economy, and tension, private ownership versus network ownership. So these collaborative platforms, should, should they be owned by the people who use them, or should they be owned by corporations? The creative economy. The creative economy is, uh, is the economy of innovators, artists, inventors, researchers. It's a very small but fundamental element in our future. We have seen how the creative economy has helped to transcend through difficulty new ideas. It's the seed for innovation in a world that bases everything on innovation. It's, it's, uh, the, the creatives are the people that also pioneer the collaborative economy. They are the first ones to use collaborative platforms. They experiment in public, 3D printing, and so on. But they suffer from a huge problem, which is called the middle, missing middle disease. The missing middle disease happens when you have very few people that actually make it to success, and a lot of people who don't make it to success, who cannot access the resources, the investors, a lot of uh, uh, players in the creative economy never meet uh, financial success, even though they have great content to share. <clears throat> the civil economy is, is really arising for smart cities and communities. It's the community's economy. It's built on values, values for people and communities, services. It's, it's, uh, it's an economy born, as I said, on smart cities and on the availability of data. Neighborly is a typical example of the civil economy. Neighborly is, a, is, a, is an app that allows you to connect to your neighbors to exchange services. Perhaps you need a nanny for an hour to take care of your kids, or you need a lift for your kid to take him to school. So neighborly allows you to do that. And this is all about the civil economy, so helping each other. This civil economy could become a model for the future. It could become fragile or very strong. <clears throat> the criminal economy, of course, is there. It's uh, scary because we have found out that the criminal economy is deeply integrated with our global economies. It has its parallel institutions, banks, lawyers, and innovates faster, much faster than we legalized economies do. It masters the decentralization and masters collaboration platforms as much as we do, and especially it will master the crypto economy, which is the seventh economy I'm going to talk about today. The crypto economy is the most difficult, perhaps, for us to understand. It's built on what we call a blockchain. A blockchain, to make it simple, is a series of operations done in an IP environment. <coughs> Bitcoin is the most famous known <coughs> crypto case, the cryptocurrency. It's built on blocks, so the crypto economy is built on blockchain. It will influence our transactions, organize our institutions in the future, and it will also establish trust because it will regulate our transactions. We will see things in this economy like end to end public encryption, multi signature transactions, you know, all these things that are very far away from now in our mind, but they're coming. But we also see personal purpose built currencies, and we'll see some cases, one case later on in this presentation. We have self managing objects, self owning objects, <coughs> network, Internet of Things objects. So, 
In this, why I gave you this introduction? Because the insights for security I'm going to give you today are coming out of this new ecosystem where there is a lot happening in the, in the intersection <coughs> in between these seven economies. So let's talk about criminal innovation zones. So as I said in the introduction of this speech, I, I work a lot with uh, civil issues and, and civil innovation. So we looked at a lot of criminality rather than armies or soldiers. And we found some interesting thing about the criminal economy. First of all, as others have been said, as many as have been said in this, in this presentation, we have a, a digital and physical world. And the intersection of this physical and digital world is where criminals are going to attack us the most in the future. This, put together with a growing social criteria, creates the perfect conditions for criminality to grow. <clears throat> and a perfect storm for criminal innovation. So what are some of those <coughs> criminal innovations? This is a drone that fell in, on the Mexico border in January 2015. So a drone carrying methamphetamines. So what, what this is bringing us a thing is that we need to design new regulatory boundaries to manage this, this, new, this new class of robots. But we also have Drug submarines, self-sinking submarines that auto-sink when they're uh, seen, and then, you know, of course they can be tracked and where the drugs can be recuperated, and they cost a little bit less than a million dollars. What this means is that often criminal networks create small-scale smart transportation systems that cost a fraction of what military contracts are usually producing. This is another case. <coughs> this is an e-cigarette hack. So it's from uh, an executive <coughs> found that the cigarette was infected by a Chinese, a Chinese virus that was constantly sending all its work back to China and all the patents, all the processes of production back to China. And it was obviously very difficult to detect. In the next decade, we're going to see some additional things like attacks on smart objects. This is a Nest. Nest, for those of you who don't know it, is a thermostat. It's a digital thermostat. You put it in your home, and it helps you to regulate the temperatures according to your users <coughs> in the house, when you're in, when you're out, so it balances your consumption. So this is a typical case of an entity in the Internet of Things which is going to be, which actually can be attacked. Facial recognition for targets in crowds. That's another technology that is being perfected and is, you know, it's going to raise in the next years. Augmented reality contact lenses. And what you can do with this is instead of sitting somewhere aiming with something, is you can just aim and do targeting just by standing and looking at something with your augmented sight. But we also have offline secure mesh networks used by uh, uh, protesters. They create local mesh peer-to-peer -peer networks to be able to communicate outside of the internet so they never get caught. We'll have crypto frameworks for large-scale distributed operations. <coughs> and we'll have uh, what I talked about before, uh, before I said self-owning objects, self-managing objects, but we also have what we call digital autonomous corporations, digital autonomous organizations, and digital uh, collaborative organizations. These are autonomous, often self-owning entities <coughs> online within the crypto economy. A case of this is Ethereum. Ethereum is a platform that is online now in beta, and it allows you to create a single purpose uh, currency. that like you can create like a, a business model and a currency to accomplish a single task, or like for example, we could build in minutes a currency to use within our conference just today. <coughs> Oops. Uh -huh. Wrong. 
This is another interesting case. That's a Ukrainian crowdfunding site built by the Ukrainian community to finance, to support the financing of the Ukrainian army. So they crowdsourced. You know, this is a drone example, as you can see. Oh, jeez. But here in the future, you could also imagine how you could crowdsource single military operations to solve local problems. One more thing, all this criminal ecosystem and uh, growing social precariat, the fragile states we live in, <coughs> and fragile corporations and economies would lead to upskilling through crime. That's another phenomena that we are witnessing. Ups upskilling through crime means that people who do not have access to education or to uh, mastering skills in the legitimate economy, they will likely find those in the criminal economy. And they will find ways through criminality to get those skills. So this is an example. It's a trust group. It's a, it, it's a website where you can be recruited to be a money mule. Money mule is somebody that carries money over the border or drugs or any other thing. This is a very interesting book by Sudhir Venkatesh, he's a sociologist who described the skills, the entrepreneurial skills and leadership skills needed to be a gang leader in Chicago. He actually spent some time interviewing gang leaders and gangs in Chicago. And they highlighted in this book how you know, they have skills that can be translated into the legitimate economy. And they actually found out that the gang leaders are excellent entrepreneurs. They don't know they are quite this too. So crime is becoming a valuable precarious pathway to build future skills. We all know these criminal organizations, and as we said, people grow their skills within these criminal organizations. So what are we doing? Some countries, like the UK, Denmark, for instance, many other countries too, but in this case, I'm only looking at those two countries, have worked out a program to reintegrate foreign fighters that are coming out of their countries and going to fight for uh, a criminal organization. When they come back to their countries to follow a program of rehabilitation and going back into, into society. So this is it. Thank you very much. I hope I stayed in time.